My first assumption is that the international system is anarchic. And anarchy here does not mean murder and mayhem. Anarchy is an ordering principle. The opposite of anarchy is hierarchy. My basic argument is, and this is not a controversial argument in the international relations literature, my basic argument is that the system is comprised of states, today we call them nation states, that have no higher authority that sits above them. They're like pool balls on a table. It's not a hierarchic system. There's no government. There's no state above all of those nation states in the system. It's an anarchic system, not hierarchic. My second assumption is that all of those states have some offensive military capability. Of course, some states have more than others. The United States, for example, has much more military capability, much more offensive military capability than any other state on the planet. Guatemala and Nigeria and Thailand, just to pick three examples at random, have hardly any military, offensive military power compared to the United States, but they still have some offensive military power. So all states have some offensive capability. My third assumption is very important, and I want to spend a few minutes developing it. This is the assumption that you can never be certain about the intentions of other states. Notice when I talk about intentions, that's different than my second point, which has to do with capabilities. My second point has to do with capabilities. My third point has to do with intentions. Anybody who's in the intelligence business knows that when you look at an adversary, you ask yourself two questions. Number one, what kind of capabilities does it have and what are its intentions? So the second assumption has to do with capabilities. All states have some offensive military capabilities. Third assumption has to do with intentions. And the argument is you can never be certain what they are. Now, why is that the case? It's because intentions are inside the heads of decision makers. And it's impossible to see inside the heads of human beings. You can never know for sure what's going on inside another individual's head. It's very different than looking at material capabilities. During the Cold War, for example, we used to spend endless hours looking at the Soviet Union. We could always determine how many SS-18s they had, how many fighter planes they had, how many armored divisions, division equivalents they had, because they were material capabilities that you could see and you could count. But we could never figure out with any certainty what the intentions were of Leonid Brezhnev, Nikita Khrushchev, even Joseph Stalin. It's just very hard to tell what their intentions were because you couldn't see them. But if you don't agree with that and you think it's possible to know what a state's intentions are today, I have a response. And that is to say, you may think you know present intentions, and I'll give you that, but you cannot tell me what the future intentions are of any state on the planet. Future intentions are unknowable. We don't even know who's going to be in charge in China in five years, 10 years, 20 years. So we can't know what that person's intentions will be. Furthermore, the circumstances in which China exists five years, 10 years, 15 years down the road is different than the circumstances that China exists in today. So future intentions are unknowable. Let me give you an example that has nothing to do with international relations that supports this basic point. It has to do with marriage. Anytime the two people get married, they think that the person they are marrying is wonderful. And they think they're going to live happily ever after. Now in a society like the United States, we have roughly a 50% divorce rate. Right? That should tell you 
that any time you marry another person, you cannot be certain that that person won't turn out to be Attila the Hun. That's not to say you can be certain that that person will turn out to be Attila the Hun. You just can't be certain that won't happen. That's what uncertainty about intentions is all about. So I've laid out three assumptions. Number one, states are the key actors in the system. That system is anarchic. Two, all states have some offensive military capability. And three, you cannot be certain about intentions. The fourth and fifth assumptions are straightforward. The fourth assumption is that the principal goal of states is survival. Survival has to be the highest goal, because if you don't survive, you can't pursue any of the other goals. Very simple. And the fifth assumption is that states are basically rational actors. They're strategic calculators. They're good at figuring out what's the best way to survive in an anarchic system where you can't be certain about the intentions of other states. So those are five assumptions. None of them point towards conflict. None of them point towards conflict. If you just think about those five assumptions. Now you take those assumptions, as I said earlier, you put them in a blender and you hit the on switch. And you get three forms of behavior. First of all, you get fear. States fear each other. Why do they fear each other? They fear each other for two reasons. Number one is you may end up living next to another state that has significant offensive capability and malign intentions towards you. You may end up living next to a highly aggressive state that has a lot of military capability. And that makes other states very nervous. The second reason that states fear each other is that if you get into trouble in the international system, there is no higher authority that you can turn to to rescue you. It is an anarchic system. So as we like to say in the United States, when you dial 911 for help, there's nobody at the other end. So states fear each other. Secondly, states come to understand that the best way to survive in the international system is to be, oh, excuse me, the second assumption, states come to realize that the international system is a self-help system. It's a self-help system, the self-help system because it is an anarchic system. There is no higher authority. So as my mother used to say when I was a little boy, God helps those who help themselves. It's a self-help system. The third form of behavior is that the best way to survive in this system, in this self-help system, is to be big and powerful. You want to be really big and really powerful. This is one of the great advantages of living in the United States. We do not go to bed at night in the United States worrying about any of our neighbors attacking us. It's unthinkable that Canada or Mexico or Guatemala or Honduras would attack the United States. Why? Because we are the biggest and baddest dude in the neighborhood. You do not fool around with the United States. It's like any one of us picking a fight with Muhammad Ali in his heyday. You want to be really powerful. Why do you want to be really powerful? Because the best way to survive in an anarchic system, again, where there's no higher authority that can rescue you, the best way to survive is to be really big and really powerful. And of course, states figure that out very quickly.